My sister was a cheerleader. She used to make straight A's. My beautiful baby. She thinks she's fat. I felt like I was dying inside and no one noticed. I thought there was no one who could understand me. I wish to die every single day. Felt like I belonged nowhere. I wanted to die. My mom was teaching in Los Angeles. I never knew who my father was. My grandparents decided to take over custody. Meanwhile, my dad's sneaking off to the bathroom to shoot heroin at church. <laughs> God wasn't real to me. My aunts and uncles did not care for me at all. It wasn't a day that didn't go by where I was either getting tossed around, knives being pulled, your mom didn't want you, and that's why we had to take you in. I was just tired of feeling like I was an accident. My dad gave me my first line of cocaine. He started becoming a very bad, evil man. He molested my sister on several occasions, tried to molest me. When I was 12, my aunts sold me to a man that lived in front of us. And I began to start cutting cocaine. I would overdose. Ecstasy. I drank bleach. Meth. This is when I became very suicidal. I just rather be dead. What I said was, God, if you want me to live, you're going to have to do it. Because I can't. I don't have the strength to pull myself out of this. I was really crying out to God. I was like, God, if you're not gonna let me go, then you're gonna have to help me. The next day, that's when I seen um, Nancy on TBN with Cece Winans. When you become a partner with Mercy Ministries, you are literally making the difference between life and death. What's so cool about Mercy is you can come in there and be horrible, but they'll still love on you because they're trying to translate God's love. It was hard because I had to really face the issues head on. We deal with issues like eating disorders, addictions, sexual abuse, girls who are suicidal, struggling with depression, unplanned pregnancy, just about every issue you can think of. Most people, when they hear about mercy, are blown away, first of all, that there's a place where girls can come free of charge. And I tell them our supporters are so wonderful, and we pray for more all the time. They make a way for that girl to literally be pulled out of death and to have the life that Christ died for her to have. I think mercy was different because it was their patience um, their willingness not to give up on me. Mercy wants the girls to feel like they have the best of the best. The home is beautiful, the furnishings are beautiful, they feed us the best food, they want us to be healthy. The reason that we take girls in free of charge are twofold. One, because so many of the young ladies couldn't get the help they needed if they had to pay, and they need to know that we're not trying to make money off their problem, that we genuinely care. Mercy has homes in Louisiana, Nashville, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Canada, and our newest home is in the Sacramento, California area. We are moving forward to begin other locations as well. I think the best lessons that I learned at Mercy were, one, that I'm not bad, that I have hope, you know, I didn't have any before. I wanted to die. I think it was a revelation that God had his hand. Excuse me. What I went through was not in vain. 
that God had a purpose and a plan for the things that I went through. That I was not an accident, but I was predestined. Because of the success, our waiting list is growing. We've actually had young women that have died while they are on our waiting list. I'm asking you to please give us your prayers and give us your support. Mercy is not a typical place. You're going to see lives changed, hope renewed. You're going to see that. I believe I'm a living testimony of that. I believe I am. It's exciting to be here. I am very, very excited about the property across the way, the new building that will be coming up out of the ground. I mean, I remember driving up on our property. You saw some of our buildings in the, in the, the DVD, but I remember driving up on the property of the Nashville home when it was just property. And I remember just, uh, I'd drive my car up there and I'd just speak to it. And I would just say, uh, I, before we got the property paid for, we, I would just go up there and I'd go, uh, property, you're debt free in Jesus' name. Walk around it, you're debt free. And then when it got debt free, then I started going, I command these buildings to come up out of the ground and you will be debt free too in Jesus' name. And you know, it was a process, but uh, the word of the Lord came forth. So we, we have to be patient. But uh, I want to say we do have a resource table back there and there are magazines that have girls' testimonies in them and ways that you can stay connected with us online to get ongoing testimonies. And, and there's uh, information in there about our insect trafficking uh, initiatives that we're doing across the country. And we are taking a lot of young women who have been rescued out of trafficking and, and we're bringing them into a place where their minds can be renewed, their hearts can be healed, their emotions can be restored, and they can be set free. And that's a whole different level of evil, but I'm telling you what, it just means when God says he's more than enough, he meant what he said. He is more than enough. So he can totally, he's up for the challenge and he can transform any life with a whole lot left over because he's more than enough. He can build any building and get it paid for with a whole lot left over because he's more than enough. And before I get into my message, I just want to say that, that 28 years ago, almost 29 now when God directed me to start Mercy Ministries, there were three things that he told me. He said, I want you to take the girls in free of charge. Many of them had been through treatment programs that had charged them thousands. But he said, I want you to take the girls in who really want help free of charge. But the, and, and the third thing he said was no government funding or any money with strings on it because have have, we have to have the freedom to help people get their hearts transformed and their mind renewed to God's word. But the, but the thing I wanted to key in on for right now is, is that he, he said, I want you to give at least 10% of everything that comes in to your ministry, to other ministries. And if you will be faithful to do that, you, you, every need that you have will be met. And then God said this to me. He said, your needs will actually be met because of your giving. And so I have no doubt that this building will be built debt-free in Jesus' name because they have decided ahead of time that they're going to give that portion and, and so their needs are going to be met. God is going, some of you business people out there and maybe you're facing struggles right now, your needs are going to be met through your giving. And as you connect yourself to this vision that's greater than any one of us as an individual, I believe God's going to prosper you and, and give you strategies for your business and give you favor with people. And, you know, all wisdom comes from God. If you need wisdom, ask. God will give it to you liberally. So I just want to encourage you with that. It was not a part of my message, but, yeah, I guess it is. Um, so, anyway... And I would encourage you to give liberally. I mean liberally because God wants your seed in the ground. I grew up on a farm and I understand about seed sowing. Sometimes my dad would, would you know, sow seed into 50 acres and sometimes it might be 150. But it, his harvest was according to the seed he sowed. And we need to realize that that's true in the realm of the spirit as well and in our giving. And, you know... Without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
But the one area that I can recall in the Bible that I don't recall that it says this anywhere else in the Bible that God says, prove him. He says, prove me. I dare you to give above and beyond. He says, Prove me and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to contain. And the other reason why, and I, you know, if you're not, everybody needs to be a tither. That 10% belongs to God, but then to give over and above that. So really seek God about that because he may tell you to do something crazy and your natural mind will go on tilt. And uh, I guarantee you that that's because God's challenging you. He wants you to give so he can give back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Every, when, I, when mercy started, you see all these beautiful buildings, they're all debt free. And they're all there because of giving. Because when I started, I had no money. I, I, friends of mine had a, a going away party for me the night before I left. Tennessee to go to Louisiana to start the first home and gave me a thousand dollars and that's where I started and you know what I did don't you I took the first ten percent off the top and sowed it immediately and it's been like that ever since and we're still there today and that's 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 very cool and I want you to know that I really appreciate your pastors uh, Pastor Troy and Pastor Penny uh, they are beautiful people they understand that that God's ways are higher than man's ways they understand the principles of God not only in, in giving, but they understand the principles of God and the truth of what God's word says about transformed lives. And it's not the building is necessary to bring the people in to bring the transformed lives. It's all a part of what we need to do to see God move. And you know, if I lived in Charlotte and I could and there was a twelve o'clock service, that would probably be the one that I would come to because I like staying up really, really late and sleeping. In. So, this might be my party people right here, I guess. I don't know. So, do we need to have an altar call? Don't even tell me what you did last night. I don't want to know. Okay. But every day, His mercies are new every morning. So, wherever you were and whatever you were doing last night, or maybe you just like to sleep, it's all good. But I'm glad you're here. I like to have fun, and I might be a little silly. But, you know, I realize that You know, there are a lot of hurting people in the world today, and I'm sure you do too. And the thing that's so cool is that God wants to transform every one of them. And he, but he draws us by his spirit and he, he gives us opportunity. And I'm here to tell you today that God wants to meet you right where you are. And, and some of you may even feel, you know, sometimes people, there's a lot of people in the world today and they just feel like they've been forgotten. They really absolutely feel forgotten, like. You know, well, I know God remembered that person over there, and I've heard their great story, and, you know, but this is me. And, and I remember even when I first became a Christian, it was easy for me to believe that God wanted to bless everybody else. But it was sometimes hard for me to believe God wanted to bless me, and I think it's because we know ourselves, you know. We know every little thing, but don't kid yourself. God does too, and he loves you right where you are. He wants to meet you right where you are, and he doesn't want you to feel forgotten. And um, w- working in the government system uh, I will have to say that a lot of those girls uh, felt forgotten that I worked, juvenile delinquent girls that I worked with, 300 of them locked up at any one time, and a lot of them did feel forgotten because they were caught in a government system where they were given no hope. They were told all the reasons why they could never be anything or move beyond their issue. And you may be a victim, but you don't have to stay a victim. But in the government system, there were a lot of girls that were even victims of the system, and they became a number, and they did feel forgotten. And I watched a lot of those girls die from drug overdoses, get killed in street gang fights. Some committed suicide. Some uh, went to the prison when they turned 18. And the reason why is because they never got the help they needed. Because it was a government-funded program and they were told separation of church and state, you can't share Christ. And they felt forgotten in that system, so much so that some of them actually felt like they had no reason to live. And they took action to make sure that they were no longer Uh, on the earth because the pain was so great they couldn't cope with it they felt like a statistic they felt like damaged goods they felt forgotten they felt like they had no hope and it was during that time of working for the government for eight years that I realized I I I don't want as a believer I don't want to work in a system and live my whole life in a system where I'm not allowed or have the freedom to share about the only one that again forgives sin heal broken hearts set people free Give us a new heart and a new spirit. And so 
it was out of eight years of working for the government that I came to realize that God has not anointed the government to heal broken hearts and set people free. He's called us to do it. He's given us the privilege. It's a privilege. And he's told us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But some of the creatures look kind of like creatures and we get freaked out because of the way they look. You know, but we need to understand there's nothing too hard for God. And you know, I want to—I just want to share with you this morning. I want the the message that I want to zero in on, to, um, you know, faith. But you know, faith for changed lives, because we are believers and we have received the truth, and we have a responsibility. It it, it says it, and when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said. God is the God, Father of compassion. Isn't that a great phrase? He's the Father of compassion. He's the God of all comfort. And He wants us to take the comfort that we have received and minister that comfort to other people because there are people out there that feel so forgotten. And there was a young lady um, named Rachel who walked through the doors of mercy um, Gosh, I, I, I think it was 2005 or so that she walked through the doors of mercy. And this is Rachel right here. Now, Rachel looks absolutely gorgeous here, but and she is gorgeous. But on the left-hand side, you can't really see it very well. Rachel had been with us. Uh, this was when Rachel first got there. If you look at the difference in her countenance, you can see that she wasn't very happy. I didn't know Rachel, but I figured Rachel was a cutter because she wore, the first two weeks she was there, I, I saw her in nothing but long sleeve shirts, and she, she had on a, like this kind of look, except it was all the way down to her wrist, and she'd pull up her, her collar, you know, a bit like this. and she, So I figured she was a cutter because it was summertime, and she always had on those long sleeves, but I hadn't really gotten to know Rachel yet. But we had a, a, a friend of mine came in and ministered, uh, was teaching the word of God, and she got a word of knowledge. She said, and she called, pointed at Rachel, and she said, may, what's your name? And the girl, you know, she said, Rachel, and she said, may I pray for you? So Rachel walks up there like this. Now, if, you're, if you ever speak in front of groups, you can imagine what a faith builder this was for, for my friend Jane who was speaking. Rachel walks up there like this. Like, God, I dare you to touch me. And so Jane began to pray for Rachel. And this is what I heard come out of Jane's mouth because I'm looking like, oh, boy, here we go because this girl's only been here a few days. And so she began to pray. And she said, Rachel, Father, I thank you for Rachel. And then she opened her eyes because we don't have to be weird when we're delivering what God tells us to deliver. And she looked at her and she said, Rachel, I hear God telling me to tell you that you are not forgotten. And so I'm, and then she kept saying it. You are not forgotten, Rachel. You are not forgotten. Well, that was a nice, sweet little word, but it, it, you know, to me it wasn't that big of a thing. But all of a sudden, because we all know that, right? We're not forgotten. But for Rachel, that was personal. And she just began to sob. And the next thing I knew, she had crumbled into the floor and was just sobbing. And so... Jane went on and spoke all the other things that God showed her. You know, you're going to get your education. You're going to be a voice. You're going to, you know, other girls that are struggling with the same thing that you're struggling with. You're going to, and God says to tell you, you're not forgotten. He's got a plan and purpose for your life. You're going to see it come forth, just all this stuff. So after it was over, she comes running up and she goes, you didn't know, did you? Did they, they tell you anything about me? And I was standing there too. And Jane looked at me and she said, I don't know anything about you. And I said, I don't either because you just got here. She pulls her sleeve up, and you can't tell it real well, but she had carved, deeply carved into her arm the word forgotten. That's how she felt. Well, let me tell you, that was in 2005. Let me tell you uh, what she's doing today. That's a picture of her there on the right. She lives in Seattle. She flew to New York and met me in a conference, and she and her mom stood with me on stage and told the story uh, of her freedom and what they went through trying to get help for all the secular routes. And, of course, cutting, you guessed it, it's a disease. You can't change it. You know, addiction is a disease. But you know what? That's what the world says because they don't know how to cure it. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if any person come to Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are new. John 10.10, 10, the thief, the devil, he comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, 
I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came to redeem us from all our destructions. And that the pain, some people are like, well, I don't get the deal about cutting. Well, you can ask any cutter, they can explain it to you. But I'll help you understand it a different way. Like I had a fall down the stairs maybe three, three years ago. And I busted my head open, had to have stitches in my forehead. But do you realize that at the moment that I landed at the bottom of those stairs, um, I didn't even know I had busted my head open. Because I also cracked my tailbone. And my tailbone was so painful that I didn't even notice this pain. And what young girls that are caught up in cutting do, they've explained it to me, that they cut themselves and all the attention and the pain that they feel right here or right here or wherever they may be cutting, that all, their, all, the, ten, all the attention goes to that and they get a momentary relief for the emotional pain and the heartache that they're feeling. Can you imagine being hurt, hurting that much? And I'm like, girl... You know, God deliver you of your physical and your emotional pain. Jesus paid the price at the cross so that we could be whole spirit, soul, and body. And he will heal that place in us that needs to be healed. And so Rachel today, she is at Seattle Pacific University studying creative writing. She's very involved with her local church. She was delivered from, she had been sexually abused. She was severely depressed. She started self-harming at an early age, trying to cope with the pain of that. And um, we opened our Sacramento, California home um, year, uh, last year. We had the grand opening in, uh, I, I want to say year before last. So it was in 2009. And she flew from Seattle with her parents and with her grandparents to celebrate that grand opening of that new Sacramento home with us. And so when we get a home here, you know, we'll have a bunch of people coming to help celebrate too. But I'll never forget her grandfather. He found me as we were giving people tours of the home after we did the dedication. He found me, and he had tears streaming down his face. And he said, do you know how much money we spent trying to get help for Rachel? We spent so much money. And they all just said, there was, you know, she would always be this way. Tears streaming down his face, he reached in his coat pocket and handed me a check for $20,000 and said, thank you for giving me my granddaughter back. How cool is that? Like, amazing. And that's, you know, God is no respecter of persons. What he does for one, he will do for all. And, and right when you think, you know, something may be too hard for God, then God will just put a story in front of you to help you know and understand that there's nothing too hard for him. You know, the secular treatment programs, they treat symptoms. They never get to the root or the heart of the problem because they don't know how. They don't understand that Jesus Christ can heal broken hearts. He puts a new heart and a new spirit in us. He gives us a new beginning. When we receive Christ, we're born again. And that old bloodline with all of the generational patterns that exist. We are born into a new bloodline. The curse is broken. And we, through the power of our choice, start a generation of blessing. So if you're beating yourself up about where you came from, what you've done, who you've done it with, or what somebody did to you, and you may very well be a victim that has a story. But you know what? What God wants you to do is to get the victim mentality out of you by, and the... And, and the uh, uh, mentality of once, an, once I was this, I'll always be this. If you have been a prostitute and you've slept with hundreds of men over the years, I've got good news for you. The moment you ask Jesus into your heart and you, and you truly confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9 says if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So that means if you are standing here next to someone who is still a virgin, that when God looks at the two of you, he sees you the same. Pure, clean, and holy in his sight. So you don't need to condemn yourself because there is therefore now, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. I'm telling you, there is nothing too hard for God. I want to share with you... Um, about another girl, and I'll, uh, I'll ask you to withhold putting her, her uh, picture on the screen till I tell just a little bit about her. But I was speaking on an open-air crusade in uh, Peru, and I met this girl. This was in early 2005, very beginning of 2005. 
And she was, she had just had been hospitalized for all kinds of things. She had been sexually abused. She was a drug addict. She was a cutter. She had tried to kill herself a number of times. She felt ugly. This is her words, ugly, worthless, unlovable, unreachable. She had tried to do all this stuff to cope with the pain that she was feeling. She had a severe eating disorder. It kept getting worse and worse. She was hospitalized. They thought she was going to die because she was so severely addicted to diet pills and laxatives. And she eventually got to the point where the eating disorder was so severe that the doctor set, told her family that she, that she would die from it. Uh, started uh, also involved was partying, drinking, doing drugs, multiple suicide attempts because the experts told her there was no hope. So she had no reason to ever expect anything better. They never told her what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. God says, these are the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. But all the experts of the world did were tell her all the reasons why that nothing would ever change. That she would always have to live with this. She would always be this way. She was going to die from this. And on and on and on. So she decided if she was going to die, maybe she would just go ahead and take herself out. And, and serious, serious suicide attempts. And at the point that I was speaking in that open air crusade, after I was done, they came and got me and went back into a tent where the guest speakers were. And right outside the tent, there was this, this girl. She had just gotten out of the hospital from uh, the time she had tried to cut her main vein to take herself out. And I want to show you a picture of her. There she is with her, her bandage on her arm. Look how sad she looks. I mean, just so sad. And you know what? We had an interpreter because she couldn't speak very, very good English. So I spoke to her through an interpreter, an interpreter who happened to be a graduate of Mercy Ministries from about five years before. And, and talk to her about that she had a choice. And God says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, This day I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you and your seed may live. And I told her, you have a choice. Don't believe the lies of the world or the treatment programs because they make money off of treat, treating symptoms. But God is a God of transformation. And he will touch you on the inside and he will put a new heart and a new spirit in you. And, and then we'll help you get your mind renewed. But it starts with you making a commitment. You making a choice. And you could tell she wanted to believe it, tears streaming down her face. Do you really think God can help me? You don't know all I've done. And, you know, on and on and on. Long story short, she came into the program of Mercy Ministries. And honestly, she broke so many rules. But you know what? I told my staff, I said, I don't care about rule breaking. We're going to work with this girl. God spoke to me. You hang on to her. I've sent her to you, and you hold on to her because she just doesn't get it, but she's going to get it. We spoon-fed her the Word of God. You ever feed a baby and they spit it back out at you? Well, she spit it out back out at us a lot, but it started taking root in her heart. God started changing her on the inside. And I want you to know that it was a little more than six. Our average length of stay is six months, but for her... Uh, it was a little more than that. But look at her. Look at her today. And let me tell you a little bit about where she is today. She's getting ready to graduate from Hillsong Leadership College in Sydney, Australia. And she is coming uh, to do a year internship with us this summer. She's going to do a year internship with us and uh, work with uh, our, the, the sex trafficking initiatives and some other things that we have going, but she also wants to preach and tell her story. And I'm telling you, the girl is on fire for God. Uh, and, and you know what? She thought she, she thought she was forgotten too, but she wasn't forgotten because Jesus went to the cross and he paid the price for every, every one of my screw-ups, every one of her screw-ups, and every one of your screw-ups. Or even those things that were done to you that you had no choice about. Because I realize there are people in here that have been sexually abused. Or you grew up in less than a, a desirable sets of circumstances. But you know what? God knows that. And he knows how to heal the hurts from the past. And he knows how to even help you use the things that happened to you to help other people. I don't believe it was God's will for her to go through. I know it wasn't. It's not God's will for a little child to be sexually molested. But he can sure heal somebody and then he can use their story. Remember what the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul murdered other Christians. He tricked Christians, would get them thrown in jail. He was a persecutor of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's people. 
But when he had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, it all changed. It all changed. And he, so he, he, was, he was so bad that when the Christians were praying for him to come to know the Lord, but when he did, they didn't really believe it was true. They thought it was another trick. And, but, but you know what? Then they began to see. And he said to his son, he said, Timothy, my true son in the faith. This is what he said to him. He said, God deliberately chose me. I was the worst sinner of them all. And God deliberately chose me so that I would be an example for anyone who comes after. That if God can change me, he can change anybody. So if you're out there thinking you all that and you big and bad and you don't know what I've done, it doesn't matter. Because the Lord knows you and he loves you and he's not holding what you've done against you. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says in Psalm 103, God has not dealt with us after our sin nor has he rewarded us according to our iniquity. For as the high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy to those who love him. There's nothing too hard for God. God is a good God. It wasn't God's will if you got abused. It wasn't God's will that happened. You go, oh, well, if it didn't happen, though, if it wasn't God's will, then why didn't it happen? It happened because John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And my Bible tells me in the first chapter of James that every good and perfect gift comes from God. And Jesus came, 1 John 3 uh, says that Jesus came for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil in your life. So Jesus came to redeem us from the destruction of the enemy. He came to redeem us from our own destructions. He came to seek and save that which is lost. He came to heal. He came to restore. He came to set the record straight. And he died once for all. And God's plan is for us to live in unbroken fellowship with him. And that plan was interrupted by Satan when, when the fall happened in the Garden of Eden. But God sent Jesus as his remedy for Satan's interruption. So we can be restored to that rightful place that we have with God. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation. And God, instead of you uh, identifying with what you've done in the past or, or, or the fact you were a victim or an addict or, or that you cheated on your taxes or you went bankrupt or you lost your marriage or whatever it may be or maybe you were unfaithful, I don't know. But you, God doesn't want you to identify with that. He wants you to confess your sin and let him forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And then he wipes it away, makes you justified just as if it never happened. And then you can walk forward with, with your future in front of you, not looking back. Your eyes are in front of your head for a reason. God has a future for you. He doesn't want you looking in the rearview mirror of regret. Or, or camping out around the things that happened to you or the things that you made bad choices about. He wants you to receive his mercy, receive his forgiveness, receive his mercies that are new every morning for you today so that you can fulfill his plan and purpose and his very destiny for your life. And I want you to know that he's told us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature means every creature. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And as we go and we proclaim liberty and freedom to people who are hurting, God watches over his word to perform it. And the Holy Spirit gets involved. Our job is to speak it. God watches over his word to perform it. And you know what? As we go, he goes with us. As these guys stepped out in faith to buy land, God went with them. Now as they're stepping out in faith to build a building, guess what? God's going with them. And whatever it is that you've got going on in your life, as you step out, God's going with you. And um, I want you to meet uh, one other person that was told there was no hope for her. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, and then I'm going to show you a picture of her. But um, her name, we call her Prisky, but her name is Priscilla. And Priscilla was born in... Puerto Rico, and she actually was adopted by a family in America when she was 13, so she comes to America for the first time. When she was 19 years old, she decided she didn't want to live under her parents' authority anymore, so she ran away from home, and, you know, she was like, 
involved in the party scene, you know, alcohol. She was in the foster care system when she was 13, and a lot of sexual abuse went on and all that. I mean, you can imagine it was just horrible for her. And so then when she gets adopted, she's already 13, and she comes to America. She had good parents, but she decided to check out the world, and she hits the streets at 19, and she just gets into all kinds of trouble, and she starts, uh, she needs to make a living, so she starts uh, going to this club, and she meets this bouncer, and he talks her into, you know, stripping, and we can begin to build a life together. We'll just do it for a little bit of time. There's good money in it. And so she decides to go for it, and so they move in, and, and he asked her to marry him, and so she's thinking, I met the love of my life, and he had a prison record, but he had gotten out of prison and supposedly was doing good, and, but they're working in this club. So they moved in together. She's thinking, this is Mr. Wonderful. They're saving their money. They're going to have a life together. And so one morning, she wakes up from their usual night together at, his, at the place that they lived, and she realizes that she's in a warehouse. She's in a warehouse and she has no clothes on. And she looks up and there's count, she counts them, nine other girls who have no clothes on. And they're all being held in a warehouse where they have no idea where they are, with no windows, nothing. And she felt something weird about her wrist and she looked down and Mr. Wonderful had tattooed on her wrist his prison number to declare his ownership over her and all of a sudden she realized that it was all a scam the the pain of that came rushing in on her he drugged me and he has me in a place now where he's going to traffic me and it turns out that he was a pimp and involved in a sex trafficking ring and so for the next four years she was sold to man after man after man after man and forced to do unthinkable things. And when she, she's kind of a fight, feisty fighter, so she, when she would get out of line, they would, they would hit her with stuff, they would burn her with cigarettes, use a curling iron, whatever they had to do. But they would torture her into compliance. And so she finally resigned herself that this is going to be her life. I mean, four years of that, I cannot even imagine. She was totally decimated, uh, had no desire to live, wished to die, would pray to die, and one night the guards were distracted because one of the girls over here was giving them a really hard time, and they were having to deal with her, and for a moment she saw that the guard that was guarding the door was distracted, and she made a, made a dash for it. And when she went to run out, he, the, guy, the guard had a blade, and he took it, and he just literally bladed her from her knee all the way up to her hip. And she was bleeding profusely, ran out into the streets, and they chased her for a bit, and then they realized we, we can't chase her anymore because it's already out here, and if they, you know, anybody sees us, well, they're going to they're gonna get us. So the, they backed off and went back to the warehouse, and the next thing she knew, she woke up and she was in a hospital. And it was the next day, and someone had found her. Now... By this time, she's like 23 years old, like 24, something like that, and no one knew what to do with her. Even, even good church people, nobody knew what to do with her. And she was hurting, and her life was a mess, and she came to Mercy, walked through the doors of Mercy. And she had not severe nightmares. She was traumatized, like all the sex trafficking girls we get. Severe nightmares traumatize all these very painful memories and they feel used and abused and like they're the scum of the earth. But let me tell you something. She received Christ. We told her about how that God would see her as if she was still a virgin. And she was hard for her to comprehend that, but she listened. And we started teaching her the word of God and not to identify with what happened to her, but to identify with being a new creation. And we taught her how to speak the word over her life and how to get her mind renewed. And we taught her about how God would restore her emotions, heal her heart. We, you want to talk about having to get somebody to forgive other people? Do you know how hard it is when somebody's been through that kind of drama and abuse to ask them to forgive, but you know what? That's what Christ asked us to do. And we said we had to break it down for it. It's not saying that what happened to you, what they did to you is okay. But you are making a way for that bitterness and that pain not to live on the inside of you. You're letting, releasing that to God, and you let him be the judge. 
and she got it, man. She understood. I need to forgive them so that God will forgive me. And they are the devil's tools, and they need to know Jesus just like I need to know Jesus. And she got it. And God did such a work, and I want you to see a picture of her. She's now, this is what she looked like when she first came to us. And this is what she looks like today, this other picture here. That's a picture she just recently came to the home in St. Louis and told her story to our girls there. And she's just a beautiful young lady. She's full of life. And she has actually taken the scriptures that we've taught her about not being a victim anymore. But she's a new creation that God has a plan of purpose for her life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. God gives his beloved sleep. And on and on and on. And you know what? She laminated one of those little loop things like if you're looking for paint colors. She laminated scriptures and she wears them on her belt to work every day. She is an amazing young woman with a tremendous call on her life. And she's doing some speaking with us and helping us with other girls who are coming out of trafficking. Can you imagine a girl who's come out of trafficking and she feels like there's no hope for her? That she would hear Priscilla's story? I'm telling you, it's nothing greater. So whatever your situation is, piece of cake for God. There's nothing too hard for God. He'll meet you right where you are. He'll get involved in your life and your situation. And he will walk with you. And he will turn you into another person. He will heal your hurts and heal your wounds. But it all starts with just surrendering your life and making a choice. Because this day the Lord says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you and your seed may live. Both your physical, natural seed and your spiritual seed. Because there are people on the other side of your obedience that need to hear your story of victory. They need to know it's possible. So God bless you. Go out there and make this church grow so fast that they have to double the size of that building, okay? All right, bless you.